folks! Today I'm doing a bit of engineering. Engineers are the closest thing to well-adjusted, productive individuals who actually do their job on the station. They only blow it up like half the time, and some of those are honest-to-goodness mistakes. A lot of folks seem to pass on engineering because it looks so complex from the outside. It's peculiar that way because even though there's so much to learn, when you know what to do it basically amounts to step one, start up the engine, step two, fuck off and do whatever you like. If your goal is to do the bare minimum of keeping the station powered for the duration of the shift in a safe and orderly fashion, it can be quite easy to do that. And I'm not talking down to that either. That means that you have more hands free on the engineering section when the time invariably comes to form a damage control crew. However, there's also the possibility of running the engine for profit, which is much more involved. This usually involves what's referred to in the vernacular as a hellburn, where instead of just using the safe, reliable, low-power OSHA-compliant furnaces to run the thermoelectric generator, you instead use the engine's combustion chamber to try to get the gas in the engine piping hot. The added pressure and heat can get the engine really cranking, but this comes with its own dangers, as this usually pushes the equipment past its safe parameters. First, we're going to do a quick overview of your general equipment as an engineer and what it does. In general, if you're not completely new to anything engineering, this is probably going to be a gigantic bore, so you might want to tune out. This is a wrench, also called a spanner. It wrenches things. Chiefly, it's useful for atmospherics. You would use it to secure a gas can or another device to a floor hookup. It also comes in handy for constructing walls. This is your screwdriver. Its primary use is for electronics. You'll also be using it for the most part to open and close the maintenance hatches on airlocks, vending machines, and fabrication machines. It also comes in handy with construction. You'll need it to secure windows to their frames, for instance. This is your crowbar. It's useful for a lot of things. You can pry things like tiles, unpowered doorways, the orbits of people's skulls, all sorts of stuff. These are your wire cutters. As with real-life wire cutters, you can use them for all manner of things for which they weren't designed, like cutting fabric or making little Zorro masks out of pieces of paper. This is your multi-tool. Very useful piece of kit. In addition to giving you more detailed information on things like wires and things with electronic locks, the multi-tool allows you to pulse wires when digging around inside doors and machines, toggling whatever setting the wire is attached to. Always remember to wear gloves, kids. This is your atmospheric analyzer. Your PDA actually carries a simpler version of this, which allows you to sample resident atmospheric composition. This big boy version, though, is critical for jobs that deal with gases, as they let you scan inside an object to detect if there are gases present, and if so, in what concentration. Since a lot of engineering deals with mixing gases, this is as important as you might imagine. This is a welder. The primary usage of the welder is in construction, but it comes in handy for a variety of other jobs. You can seal up doors with it so they can't be opened, heat beakers, light cigarettes, throw them into rooms full of explosive gas. Real jack of all trades. This is your T-ray scanner. T-ray scanners allow you to see through floor tiles in order to track the location of wires. They can also briefly disrupt cloaking fields, which really only serves to inspire terror because you get a split-second glimpse of a person with a sea saber, and then suddenly they're gone. In any case, it'll still function while on sitting in your pocket, so that's where it goes most times. That'll about sum up the content of these, your standard issue tool belts. This ain't gospel or nothing, but it should cover most things. If you want to keep your belt slot for something else, like, say, an oxygen tank, one of these boxes can also fit tool-sized items, and can be placed inside a backpack for some very space-friendly but less timely mode of access. Now, You'll notice that on both ends of the loop, you have these convoluted sections of piping that bend in these big S-curves, so they kind of fill up the entire surface area of the floor. These are important. They're built that way to maximize surface area, kind of the same way a refrigerator works or an air conditioner. 
Or if you've never taken a look inside either of those things, a CPU cooler or a wart chiller. In the case of the hot end, it passes through the combustion chamber, and you've got this maximized amount of surface area in contact with a burning plasma air mix. On the cold end, it passes through space, which really doesn't make a lot of sense, and probably only works because the simulation isn't that complex. I'm no physics learning man, but if I recall, space is notoriously difficult to dump heat into because, well, there's, there's nothing there. Heat at a molecular level is mostly motion. You've got these little atoms vibrating up a storm down there. In space, there's no accompanying field of atoms to pass that heat onto, like with a liquid or something, so the only way heat can be transferred out is through radiative cooling, which is why radiators and insulation are so important to spaceship design if you don't want your fragile human cargo to cook. Boy, can they cook. I actually tried filling the radiator section on the cold loop with water once, and it does seem to give a minor performance boost. But honestly, it isn't worth your time. For now, just think, space cold, much blue pass through space, cool down gas. The engine's problems can basically be divvied up into two categories, stuff getting bigger and stuff getting smaller. Stuff getting bigger is the usual problem, because as anything heats up, it tends to get bigger. In this case, however, what's getting bigger is superheated plasma, so if it gets big enough to, say, escape its tiny metal pipe prism, it'll instantly come into contact with air, with oxygen in it, which will then instantly turn into a combustion mixture, which will then combust. Spectacularly. This is why it's usually good practice to evacuate the engine chamber using the RCD. You poke out holes at these locations, or wherever you get the feel for. You may need to ask the chief engineer for permission to use this, as it's usually kept under lock and key in their office. On the other hand, things occupy less space the colder they are. This relationship is part of why aerosol cans can get really cold when you use them, at least as I understand it. I mean, it's mostly from the fact that there's a state change going on inside the can, and the energy for that state change has to come from somewhere, but you're also dropping the pressure on what's left, so Gay-Lussac's law kicks in. You need enough volume left in the cold loop to continue sapping adequate heat from the hot loop, and this volume can decrease as time goes on as the gas gets colder, though this is usually an unlikely outcome if, like most engineers, you're trying to set off some sort of ungodly, self-sustaining fusion reaction in the combustion chamber. Anyhow, you may need to add some more gas in there. This can lead to weird situations where you'll have to pop, say, one can of plasma in the hot loop and two in the cold loop. Generally, this problem only shows up at lower temperature burns, such as with a char burn. This is the type of burn I'm going to show you first, as it's nice and safe, mostly. First, you suit up. Get yourself some mesen goggles, a tool belt, and click-drag your toolbox into said belt. Nab a multi-tool to complete your loadout. Since we're going to make a char burn, there's no need to really gird yourself against the void's tender embrace, but if you were going to do so, the spacesuits are located over here. First, haul the crates of char over to the furnaces here in the engine. Open them up, and click-drag them to the furnaces in order to fill them up. Leave them off for now, but fill them to capacity. Next, attach one or two cans of plasma to the hot and cold loop hookups. Think of this as the engine's blood, sort of. Plasma has unique thermal properties that make it ideal as a medium for carrying heat, and so it remains the go-to filler gas for the engine loops. More experienced engineers can add other gases to achieve unique effects, but that's some real big brain shit firmly beyond the grasp of my atrophied tigger. Once that's done, you need to open up both loops so that the gas can flow freely through the engine. It's sufficient to simply follow the loops and pay attention to what each valve is labeled, but if you need a big picture look, things should flow something like this. Notice that the combustion chamber is absent in this setup. Using it requires opening up a bypass which lets gas flow through it in order to pick up heat. Anyhow, after you've used your wrench to hook up your plasma cans, go back to the main generator room. 
If you've completed this step correctly and opened up the valves properly, the generator should be beginning to spin up slowly. You can check the pipes now using your atmospherics analyzer and see how the pressure and temperature looks. At this point, you can flip those burners on. The temperature should rapidly begin to climb in the hot loop after this point. While the level of power generated by this type of simple burn isn't that impressive, certainly not enough for export, it's very safe and relies on what's essentially a junk filler material that the mining department would otherwise throw away or export for peanuts. From this point out, you can adjust the SMES units in the engine room to capitalize on the available power once the burn is stable, and then tangle with the station's secondary power system, the solars. While a lot of people don't bother fucking around with the solars, they are pretty important. The solar arrays are usually attached to the local secondary SMES units, which help to stabilize power across the grid and provide a level of redundancy in case part of the ship gets vaporized. If you're lucky, you'll have an industrious AI who will have set the solars up before you even manage to finish the engine. If not, it's up to you to go run around the ship and adjust the input for the SMES units so that they're just a tick under what's coming in from the arrays. This is to make sure that the SMES units charge as quickly as they can, ensuring that you have a bigger cushion for emergencies. While most of the SMES units can be reached through the maintenance tunnels, on COG-1, where we are, there is one array that you'll have to hop into a pod to reach. It's the one here, tucked behind security, a department seldom inclined to let you waltz through in order to get your job done. So just circumvent them entirely. Come in and hit it from the back. Set it up without anyone knowing you came through. Perfect. Now, if you did want to set up a combustion chamber, this is the general gist of how you do it. Since this is COG-1, you don't have to fiddle about with artisanally mixing your gases by hand like they used to do in the old country. You can use the mixing control computer to do it for you. What you want is a mixture that is one-third O2 and two-thirds plasma. So hook up a plasma can and an oxygen can to the combustion chamber hookups here, and go over to adjust the mixing computer accordingly later. The interior hookup is hookup 1, and the exterior hookup is hookup 2. Before moving forward, I was taught to use the RCD to punch a hole in the floor right here. You'll have to hit the chamber vent button in order to retract the shutters to do this. There's a lot of superstition and competing lore about how to do a hellburn correctly, but I'm just going to do what I was taught for starters. Could be that it does nothing, or even has a negative effect now. A lot in the engine's code has changed in the last year. I'd try it without anything fancy for your first try. Once that's out of the way, make sure the chamber isn't venting and turn on your valves here. Then head back to the control room back here and switch your gas mixture over to whatever mix you want. Back in the combustion chamber, the room should rapidly be flooding with gas and the resulting mixture is sufficiently volatile that it will often just catch fire of its own accord without needing a source of ignition. Once the chamber is full of burning gas, hit the vent button. What this will do is allow the vacuum of space to pull burning gas rapidly over the heating coils, making them much hotter, at least in theory. Observe how the color of the flaming gas changes subtly over time. This is a reflection of how rich or lean your mixture is, essentially. Generally speaking, the lighter it is, the better. Experts can actually get their gas mixtures blue hot, and the results are accordingly spectacular. Basically, you don't want to smother your mixture with too much fuel, but neither do you want it to sputter out for lack thereof. If you've inherited a previous burn that used a conventional char-cooler combo, Make sure to turn both the furnaces and the coolers off. While useful for ramping up to a hellburn sometimes, they seem to interfere with how hellburns work, at least at the time of this recording. I'm sure someone knows exactly why, but for me, I actually sat down and tested it once, running a hellburn setup at the same time as the furnaces and coolers. 
The moment I turned them off, the power level absolutely skyrocketed. Probably worth more close experimentation in the future. In any case, if you've properly opened up your combustion chamber detour into the hot loop, it should rapidly get very, very hot. Remember to punch out the floors to vent the interior of engineering if you do this, because one of those pipes is definitely going to burst at some point, and you don't want there to be atmosphere around when it happens. There's also the additional hazard of the gas cans themselves. If it gets hot enough inside the chamber, they can actually just pop off of their own accord and flood the entire room with their contents all at once. Very nasty. The next type of engine is kinda deep. Excuse my punnery. Under the sea, there is bountiful energy to be tapped from undersea volcanism. This type of engine is quite different from any other in that it's almost completely safe. A real first as far as goongineering is concerned. However, it's a tad complex for a first timer. Let me show you how it works. First, suit up and back here. Get some form of internals going. I recommend personally that you just Take your emergency tank, pressurize it up to max, and stick it in your pocket to free up your back. But that's just me. Then get on a diving suit and some flippers. Seafloor movement slows you down in a variety of ways, and some items like flippers ease the penalties somewhat. Then come out into the engineering bay proper and get yourself a coil of this special waterproof wiring. One of these stomper units, a shovel, a vent capture unit, and three of these funky Stargate-looking staff things. These are your dowsing rods, and they're going to help us triangulate an active thermal vent to tap. While you can technically make do with only one rod, three is nice, because it allows you to more quickly gain a directional lead on your vent. With all this gear in tow, turn on your internals and head out the airlock. Remember to cycle it properly so as not to let any water inside the engineering bay. Make sure before you leave that you've snagged a multi-tool at some point. You're gonna need it. Now we gotta search around for a geothermal vent. Currents of superheated steam coursing below the surface, driven hither and thither by undersea volcanism, these vents, once tapped, will provide the station with clean, renewable energy. However, they're kinda capricious. Hotspots, as they're termed, will shift around the ocean floor, causing sporadic earthquakes which will sometimes endanger the station. Your stomper unit is capable of shunting hotspots away from their point of impact. But more importantly, if a stomper unit is activated dead center on top of a hotspot, it can nail it in place. This is what we need to do in order to obtain power from them. It's also why we brought so many dowsing rods. Dowsing rods, when in proximity to a hotspot and deployed on the ground, will display how far away the nearest spot is, like so. Therefore, when a rod displays zero, that means that one of the immediately adjacent spots has a hotspot in it. So, making very sure you keep track of which direction the station is located in, this phase of your job consists of walking out and periodically sticking a dowsing rod into the ground until you get a read. Once you do, you know a hotspot is close and you can begin sticking more dowsing rods into the ground in order to narrow down the exact location. Once you're getting reads of ones and zeros, the fact you have three rods will begin to come in very handy, as it will speed up finding the exact square with a hotspot. Once you've found the hotspot's exact location, drag your stomper unit onto it and activate it. It's good practice at this point to cross one's fingers, because if you've fucked up, what the stomper unit will do instead of nailing down the spot is to shunt it some distance away, meaning you have to start the process all over again. There! Lucky us! As you can see from the little message which appeared in the log here, we've successfully nailed down our first hotspot. Now we can tap it for energy. First off, 
take some of your cable and run it from the hotspot to any other square. Then pull out your shovel and dig through the hotspot square in order to open it up. Once you've dug out a channel to the sweet scalding goodness below, you want to stand on top of the hotspot square and deploy your vent capture unit. Step back from your work and inspect the vent unit to make sure it's getting power. Then, bam, step is done. Bask in your competency. Of course, the power ain't much use to us unless we get it all the way back to the station. Luckily, undersea cable has a unique property. It can be paid out very rapidly as one walks. Stand on the end of that cable piece you ran into, and then, with the reel of cable in your hand, click on the cable itself. You'll get a message saying that you're now automatically paying out cable. From then on, it's simply a matter of walking back toward the station and finding these. These three wires are your engine hookups. Before you finish your connection, check the wire leading back to the vent with your multi-tool to make sure power is flowing. Then, ta-da! You've added one generator to the network. You can go back inside and adjust the SMES units appropriately. Continue hooking up vents and you may be able to beam excess power up from the seafloor to a waiting satellite in geosynchronous orbit. I think. That's, that's, that's gotta be where it goes. Probably. One last note. There's an extra little orphan wire coming off the engine room that leads to this thing. This is your station's cargo carousel. Energy you pipe into this wire will go to making the station's belts go faster. Do with that information what you will. The last type of engine we're going to talk about is seldom seen anymore. It's the original engine type, and it's hideously dangerous. It's been replaced by the thermoelectric energy generator, presumably because too many shifts ended two minutes into the round, with an engineer shouting over open comms that somebody fucked up somewhere and now there's a singularity loose, would someone please call the shuttle? Using the magic of plasma, something like hawking radiation or rotational space-time or some shit is harnessed for the awesome task of running coffee machines and butt bots. Setting up the Singularity engine is actually pretty simple, but any misstep will spell disaster. Before anything, make sure you throw your goggles on. Black holes are dynamos of raw attractive energy and almost nothing can escape from them. This includes your unshielded peepers, as your gaze is drawn inexorably toward its hideous beauty, leaving you dumbfounded and drooling. It goes without saying that this is unacceptable behavior for an engineer, as drooling on floors presents a trip hazard. You're also going to want to don some gear to protect yourself from the queer, otherworldly particles being shot out of this thing at near light speeds. If you don't, well, hope you like your DNA extra jumbled. After you've gotten all dressed up and filled out your tool belt, you're going to want to take the extra step of throwing on some mag boots. Once the singularity's on, it's going to draw anything not bolted down toward it, including people. This can be troublesome. Then, walk over here to the engineering department's gas storage room. Here, you can take out a few plasma tanks. You're gonna need six tanks in total, slotting them into these radiation collector arrays. Make sure the sprite changes, like so. After that, it's time to construct a field that's gonna keep our ever-collapsing ball of hatred from consuming the station. First, go to each of these things. These are your field generators. Leave them where they are for now, as they're perfectly arranged at round start to contain that little jar of singularity in the middle that you definitely don't want to touch. For each emitter, you're going to need to wrench down its retaining bolts like so, and then weld them down to the floor, like this. Make sure after each step that you get a message indicating completion, because it's possible to, say, run out of fuel mid-weld and not complete the process. This would be bad. Now it's time to handle the emitters. These are what beam power to our field generators. It has to be done this way, essentially wirelessly, presumably due to the fact that wires close to the singularity might get pulled right off the goddamn floor. These need to be powered conventionally, but if you stick with the regulation attachment points at these six locations, you ought to be golden. 
like the field generators, they need to be wrenched into place and then welded to the floor. Once that's done, you have the option of taking one more extra precautionary step. When the Singularity is freed from its prison, its strange energies will instigate all manner of fuckery with electronics around the engine. This includes the engine's own doors, so if you want to be extra careful, go to each of these doors in turn and open them up with your screwdriver. Through pulsing wires, find out which wire is the bolt wire and bolt down the door. Then, if you want to be extra careful, cut all the other wires and then reclose the maintenance hatch. This creates a door that's very hard to open, and as a bonus, won't randomly be toggled open by the singularity. As you might imagine, an open door leading into the interior of the chamber is going to be one big health and safety hazard. With that done, we want to go over to each of the emitters and unlock them with our engineering ID card. Toggle them on, and then lock them back down with your card so no one can fiddle with them. Once all four are on, you can ready the collection apparatus you were sticking plasma in earlier. Go down the line here and turn on all of these machines to prep them for normal operation. When all of those are on, head over here to the engine start console. Once upon a time, you would have had to start the engine manually. A very dangerous process involving fancy footwork and one very unfortunate intern who drew the short straw. Now though, you can use this computer to automate the process to some degree. Pop your ID in and log in like so. Then type Engine Master. Once you're in, type Rescan. This will essentially feel around the network for all the stuff you just hooked up. Finally, if no error messages or red flags or nothing propagate by this point, you can start the engine. Run back into the room and press your face to the glass in order to witness the majestic birth of the end of all things. Make sure that when it's all said and done, you set up the SMES banks. You could probably just set on a maximum, but if you want to play it safe, 100,000 is a fine choice in case power suddenly dips for some reason. Being an engineer, babysitting the Singularity engine is kind of different from any other engine crew job. Your main concern isn't the engine. The engine is set it and forget it. If you can start it without killing everyone, you're pretty much golden. No, your main concern is the rest of the crew. From the moment you press that start button, your main job is going to be keeping people out of this room so they can't fuck up your work and doom the ship. Do with that information what you will. Invariably, shit's gonna break. Either through continued stress, human error, or deliberate sabotage, things are gonna begin to come apart. It's your job to keep things in working order through the magic of duct tape and faith. Just like Ed Smiley would a darn. Your most common patch jobs are gonna be of the simplest type, the kind that results from explosive decompression. Shit blows up, and even if shit doesn't blow up, some godless little shit heel assistant is probably going to kick a window out just because he thinks it's funny to watch folks suffocate. Before anything, you're going to need a damage control cart. That's what these things are, usually hanging out either inside or around engineering. You're going to want to make sure there's glass, metal, wire, rods, and metal foam grenades, either in there or on your person. If the breach is very big, you want to place one of these foam grenades in the breach for starters, essentially making a big old metal scab over your station's ouchie so no more oxygen escapes. Once that's done, it's time to construct a rough approximation of whatever got fucked up. Floors can be constructed on void tiles by using rods, which will lay down an integument. 
followed by floor tiles, which can be constructed by using stacks of metal sheets. Walls work in kind of the same way. By using a stack of metal sheets on top of a floor tile, one can create bare girders as a base to make either regular walls or reinforced walls. 90% of the time, regular walls are sufficient. Doubly so, because reinforced walls take up a lot more metal and are an absolute bitch and a half to disassemble. Though, mercifully, you will be guided through the process by prompts every time you fuck up. It's worth mentioning that you can create hidden doors by dislodging girders with your crowbar before you use metal on them. This can be useful for creating bolt holes to escape from the fuzz. If any lights have been broken during the explosion, you can detach the broken bulb or tube with an open hand and source a suitable replacement from any auto lathe. They even come in different colors. Finally, windows can be created by clicking on either glass or reinforced glass with your active hand. New windows will be fully secured in place, but in general, windows not attached to anything need to be secured with a screwdriver, popped into place, and then lock down with a screwdriver to finish. You can use this property to create those fancy hyper-strong windows you see in some sensitive parts of the station. First, use rods to make a grill. Then, make directional single-pane windows. One by one, each after the other. Use your screwdriver, and then your crowbar, and then your screwdriver again to fully detach the window from the ground. Then, Use your crowbar to turn the windows into your desired positions. Make four windows this way, covering all but one direction. This is the direction you're gonna step out of the square from. Then, before you leave, make a full-sized window to cover the whole square. After you've stepped outside, you can manipulate the last dislodged directional window, by right-clicking on the square in order to move it back into the direction it originally occupied, at which point you can re-secure it. This type of window can be extremely strong while still providing a beautiful view of the outside, especially because each of its parts could conceivably be further reinforced by a chemist. If any disposal pipes have been severed by the explosion, these can be repaired as well. Pipe dispensers are scattered throughout maintenance and look for all intents and purposes like regular old fabricators. First, you gotta remove the remains of the old pipe. That's this jagged lip left around here that you can remove with your welder. Then, move the new pipe section into place and rotate it into the right direction with your crowbar. After that's done, you can weld the pipe back into place where the old one was. Cover it up with some floor panels and it's as good as new. Probably. Using all this knowledge, ta-da! You've created yourself a brand new hallway. Unfortunately, it's likely that said hallway is both cold as balls and bereft of breathable atmosphere. We can't have people running around all day in internals. People need that mask slot for their sweet, sweet smoky smokes. So we're gonna need to fix this mess. To do this, take one of these big tanks. Either white, representing a standard oxygen mixture, or white and red, representing a highly pressurized variant of this mix. Blue tanks will work too, but those are pure oxygen, and so they're a bit more precious. Goon Atmospherics is such that it's simultaneously very easy to depressurize an area and kinda difficult to fix it. You may need to drag the canister around a bit while venting its contents in order to stir the gas soup around, basically. In some cases, there are actually dedicated Atmospherics hookups points located in maintenance. The most common juncture for this is over here, by tech storage. Most such hookups are both labeled and surrounded with pre-pressurized Atmos cans, so it's good to memorize where they are if you intend to play a lot of engineer. Now that that's done, all that's left to do is warm the area back up. One or two of these handy-dandy space heaters you see around the station ought to do the trick. You can even fiddle with the internal temperature settings by opening the maintenance panel with your screwdriver if you want to get the place real toasty. And there! One almost sorta of good as new hallway. 
If you want, now would be the time to flip on that T-ray scanner and see if any cables have been severed by the damage, and if so, run a patch line to reconnect things as best you can. If any APCs have been broken amidst whatever chaos you're fixing, those can be repaired too, up to a point. If your APC is merely busted, like this one, you'll need a screwdriver, wrench, multi-tool, and cable coil to repair it. First, use your screwdriver on the APC to open it up. Then, use the wire to fix this rat's nest tangle of fucked connections. This step may take a bit, so don't go jumping the gun. After that's done, go about wrenching things back into place. This also may take a bit. Finally, when you get the confirmation message that that step is complete, apply the multi-tool to recalibrate things, and then the screwdriver to seal it all back up again. If the APC has somehow lost its battery during the scuffle, you may need to source a replacement at this point. A completely destroyed APC needs the intervention of a mechanic, who will basically scan in an APC diagram and build a new one from scratch. But that ain't your job. That is a work order. In addition to this very basic primer and damage control, there are a few topics that don't really fit in anywhere, but that you should really get to know anyhow. First of all, fact of the matter is, not all of your assignments will necessarily be spaceborne. The company may post you to one of our undersea facilities, which poses a host of new issues, most centered on the fact that you're trying to keep pressure out instead of in. However, undersea damage control can be summarized as regular damage control with the addition of your pumping apparatus here. When you see a flooding section, grab one of these pumps for maintenance and turn it on. Slowly but surely, it will suck up any liquids present and pack them into a highly pressurized internal reservoir, allowing you to minimize further flooding while you work on patching the floors like you normally would. Careful not to fall into any holes while doing this. Secondly, you don't have to go it alone, and you shouldn't, especially with larger disasters. No, I'm not referring to your fellow engineers. They've probably fucked off, or are dead, or have decided to build their own fortress of solitude full of baked goods or something. No, I'm talking about the ever-reliable Floorbot. Floorbots are like your plucky junior damage control crew members, and can be stuffed full of floor tiles and let loose in a disaster area to help patch things up. You can even fiddle with their controls, since as an engineer you have clearance on your ID to do so. You can turn them off, and then drag them into damage control carts in order to have them ready for deployment wherever shit hits the fan. They may not be as quick on the draw or as smart as a real engineer, but as it never rains but only pours, you can often expect to have to deal with multiple punctures in the station's hull at once. If you're the only one on duty, it's perfectly acceptable practice to simply throw a loaded floorbot at the less dire breach and then go and handle the more severe one yourself. Finally, there's the issue of fire. As an engineer, you're what passes for a firefighter on the station, as evinced by the rack of firefighting gear in most engineering supply rooms. Generally speaking, you're going to want to cover up everything you can while fighting a fire. Make sure you've got at least a firefighting suit on, a helmet of some sort, and most importantly that you have internals equipped and that they're active. Breathing in superheated gas is highly unpleasant and greatly reduces your firefighting efficiency, as you will be dead. For the really, really bad fires, you want these heavy-duty suits, which are sometimes located in the center of the engine bay. They'll slow you down quite a bit, but they essentially turn you into the fury. You'll give minimal fucks about fire unless you're actively marinating in burning plasma. Always remember to drag along a tank of firefighting foam with you on these big jobs, because your extinguisher is going to rapidly be depleted. These things are meant for burning Christmas trees, trash cans, and the occasional grease fire and you're using the moonlight as an extra in backdraft. Consider yourself forewarned. Alright. That's about the size of it, I reckon. That one took a little while to produce, didn't it? A lot of stuff happened. I got my degree, trying to find a real job with it, not much luck with that. My circle of friends reached the terminating point in their D&D game and voted me as the next DM, so I spent a couple months in frantic activity just 
trying to get the setting I've been working on for years done. I'd love to share it sometime. I'm, I'm real proud of it, but I'm not sure I could get away with sharing it since it's absolutely rife with copyrighted bits and pieces. I was down with the flu for a while, like a whole damn month. Uh, this was before the recent scare, about a month before. Used the time to play a couple games of Colonial Marines when I wasn't unconscious or delirious on flu meds. That was nice. You know, I, I find myself fascinated by the idea of the UPP. I wonder if they'll ever have a one-off special event that happens, kind of like Whiskey Outpost, where you've got a UPP vessel instead of the Almire, and you gotta go investigate shenanigans. Like, hey, this fucking United America's colony we've been spying on went dark, and we know their closest vessel is days away. We want you to go down there and figure out what went wrong and steal everything that isn't bolted down before they get here. <laughs> All your gear could be like jank-ass future Soviet stuff that's reliable and hits like a truck, but it's heavy and bulky and has no bells and whistles. Like it'd be the reverse of an Almeyer round where you go to the QM and it's like, Privet! Oh, attachments, comrade? Da, here is bayonet! And instead of some futuristic badass tank like the Longstreet, your armored support is literally a hand-me-down T-54 with a coaxial douchka. <laughs> like, your medical gear won't be as good, but you have a bandolier with meth auto-injectors. <laughs> Just getting down and dirty with Xenos and you're high as a fucking kite. Ah, oh, well. I've prattled on long enough. Hope you folks enjoyed the video. I will see you round.